a teaching resource. Moment. Coming next, remarks by former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Yesterday, he spoke at a national policy conference sponsored by the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. Dr. Kissinger discusses post-Cold War challenges facing the United States and the opportunities in a world transformed by the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Since, since this is our final break, I wanted it to be an enduring one. No, they're, they're coming. Ladies and gentlemen, we have gone through a great deal together in these last two days. We have had five panels, and we are planning to have five speakers, and we now have the last, the culminating speech. Uh, as you know we, from our various panels and discussions, this is a far more turbulent world as a result of the end of the Cold War. It is more difficult to analyze. It is subject to continued and disconcerting change. And as a result, analysis and diplomacy are far more difficult than they are when there are clear lines of division in the world. That may constitute a special problem for the United States. Uh, Americans are not well suited to analyzing other people's cultures and societies. Uh, Americans do not have much of a curiosity about history. Bob Gates just referred to the need for reminders of the past. Americans tend to believe with the late Henry Ford that history is bunk. And besides that, other peoples aren't that much different. They all just want simply to be Americans. So the essential ingredient for a great diplomat is an understanding of other cultures and an understanding of history, which permits one to understand what motivates other societies. And in that way, one will be able to anticipate how they will react to actions of our own. No one that I know has a greater understanding of what motivates other societies no one has a greater understanding of history, and no one has a greater ability to anticipate the reactions of other societies than my colleague and classmate, former Secretary of State, Henry A. Kissinger. Mr. President, Jim, friends from so many common battles, and ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Mr. President, you should have been so lucky as to hear Jim Schlesinger say such good things about me when we were in your cabinet <laughs> together. 
But I appreciated them uh, greatly as colleagues for many decades and having learned so much from Chip. When I was asked by the President to be a speaker here, I thought it would be one of these philosophical meetings where I could give a pondered speech on the New World Order. Bill Sapphire could have then written that my verbs appeared only every five minutes. <laughs> and uh, it was, however, has now turned into what I think will turn out to be a rather seminal occasion. It is a, an astonishing tribute to President Nixon that after all these years, he could, in one speech, chart again a path in, in the direction of which we need to go, and to start a debate which will contribute in a decisive way to the creation of the new international system and above all to the reintegration of the countries of the communist world into an international community. Whenever I have the privilege of <coughs> speaking in the presence of President Nixon, I have to remember occasions when I would present some document to him in my somewhat ponderous style, which passes for profundity <laughs> at Harvard. And he'd pick out a few words of more than two syllables, and he'd say, now remember, the average person will think that this is a soft drink. And <clears throat> there was another crucial lesson among many that I learned from uh, President Nixon. The major foreign policy decisions of his administration, regardless of what was reported at the time, were taken by him were not ever taken impulsively, sometimes to the great regret of the staff that went through excruciating deliberations while the decision was, uh, was being made. And my tendency occasionally was to suggest some way to hedge what was being decided. And the president always said, remember, you pay the same price for doing something halfway as for doing it completely. I think that it's an important lesson for the conduct of foreign policy. Leaders have a choice to act or not to act. They get no awards for failing by half measures. And it is a lesson that applies in every period, including, obviously, our own. So <coughs> it is a privilege for me to see what grade I get when I conclude my remarks from somebody from whom I've learned an enormous amount. <clears throat> the subject which I was asked to address was America's role 
in the New World Order. As a student of history, I can think of few examples, in fact I can think of no example, where a nation achieved so completely what it set out to do as the United States has in the last two or three years. If one compares what the bipartisan leaders of the late 40s and early 50s were saying of the kind of world that they wanted to bring about, it is almost exactly what has happened, except that nobody believed that it would happen so quickly. I know no one, at least I knew no one before this morning, <laughs> who had uh, predicted the evolution in the Soviet Union. Now, Mr. President, if you hold another conference a couple of years from now and do me the honor of inviting me, I will no doubt have convinced myself that I saw it clearly at every stage. <laughs> <laughs> but at this point, I must say that while I had some belief of a disintegration of the satellite orbit, it did not occur to me that we would see the twin revolutions through which we are now living. The collapse of communism in the Soviet Union and the collapse of the imperial system of the Russian Empire. The first revolution destroyed institutions that are 75 years old. The second revolution destroyed an enterprise that has gone on relentlessly, uninterruptedly, for 300 years. Now this achievement of the United States has projected this country into a world for which it has very little philosophical apparatus. The Cold War coincided with a very, f with certain categories with which we were quite familiar. One was the experience of the New Deal in which we had learned that political instability can be cured if a gap between economic expectations and reality can be closed. That was the foundation for the Marshall Plan, for economic aid programs, and similar activities. The second was the experience of the 1930s and 40s where appeasement had failed, and then under American leadership, total victory was achieved in a struggle against a country that at that time represented absolute evil in Nazi Germany and unusual aggressiveness in Japan. So those two experiences provided leadership groups and concepts which could be applied to the two-power world of the Cold War, in which again required great American efforts and also was perceived correctly as a struggle of good versus evil. <clears throat> we in America do not always realize how unique 
the American approach to foreign policy has been historically. I know no other nation that believes in a similar way a number of the following propositions. One, that what it does and says is of universal significance. It is not an expression of the national interest, but an expression of universal principles. And that therefore America has an obligation as a beacon of liberty. The belief that personal morality and international morality are identical. The belief that national interest is somehow wrong, but that one has to stand for universal principles. The idea that America defends not special concerns, but collective security. And when you read American presidents speaking of foreign policy, you will find these themes from Wilson through the incumbent, always repeated. If I may say so, with one exception, which was President Nixon, who repeated these themes also, but managed to relate them to concepts in which all other nations, without exception, have had to conduct foreign policy on narrow margins of survival, on the relative satisfaction of their goals, on nuances of foreign policy. The great challenge of contemporary American foreign policy is we have now graduated into a world of four, five, six, seven, depending on the time frame you pick, more or less equal countries. I know, I, I know documents which claim that we can impose a particular preference on a universal scale. It is beyond the capacity in the long term of our political system to be the military policeman of the whole world. Even though without us there can be no security. In such a world we need to have some concept of equilibrium, some relationship of objectives to historical processes. I don't say that we have to become like the nations of the old world. The nations of the old world managed in pursuit of perfectly sound international theory to produce the colossal catastrophe of World War I. We have sometimes overextended ourselves in pursuit of crucial and fundamental values. If you look at the history of the Cold War, the victory that I described could never have been achieved without American idealism. And even if some particular applications were marginally naive, one has to remember that cynics don't build cathedrals. Now it's in this context that I'd like to make a few observations about the theme that has preoccupied this conference. And particularly the theme of 
major aid program to Russia in support of the Russian leadership. And I would like to put that in the context of the general observations that I have advanced. First, let me say that, repeat what I said at the beginning. President Nixon has described a path with which I agree. There has been a huge revolution destroying ideologies and international systems in the area of Europe going from the Elbe to Vladivostok and encompassing an empire that reaches Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. Something has to replace that vacuum or it will be a source of eternal turmoil. So I agree with the call for this effort. I have told the President that there are some nuances which, if we sat down together, I would raise with the confidence that after a few days of discussion, we would reach the complete agreement that always existed on all major policy decisions, and I must say on all minor foreign policy decisions, between uh, President Nixon and myself, and I want to make clear, he was the one who made the decisions. Now, <coughs> the question I want to raise is whether one should make the justification of a program depend on the political future of any one leader in any one country. Secondly, whether it is ambitious enough to make the political evolution of that vast area depend on the political progress and economic progress of one of the countries, even though it is the largest and the most important one. And three, whether it is enough to concentrate only on an economic program of whatever magnitude for one of these constituent countries. I want to emphasize that this is not a disagreement in principle. It is an agreement in principle. It is a question of implementation. As President Nixon, and probably learning from President Nixon's brilliant account of his visit to the Soviet Union, I came to share his view that much as I respected Gorbachev's contributions to getting the system into motion, that Yeltsin probably represented a more viable future. I have no reason to question what the director of Central Intelligence said a few minutes ago about his role. But in the long run, I believe that the foreign policy of any country must be determined by its fundamental interests and the foreign policy of the United States must be related to the weighing of these interests. And therefore, it is the role of that country that must be judged and not simply one particular leader, no matter how important and no matter what its role. Secondly, 
If I look at history, I must say that one source of the tragedies of maybe of centuries has been the extraordinary expansionism of Russia. And it has been a tragedy for the Russian people even more than for all the surrounding countries. For 300 years, that state has expanded from the area around Moscow to the shores of the Pacific, to the gates of India, to the center of Europe, touching very many different cultures. And I tend to believe that a rhythm of that nature represents a certain proclivity. <clears throat> In the last, since Peter the Great, Russian troops have invaded their neighbors 17 times. And therefore, while one can explain some of it by a compulsive sense of insecurity produced by the absence of any natural borders, some of the compulsive insecurity was also created by the acquisition of more and more foreign populations, which had could be kept together only by inventing or believing in an outside threat larger than its internal animosities. So the United States has two apparently contradictory necessities at this moment. Russia, extending from St. Petersburg to Vladivostok, is one of the greatest nations in the world. It extends over 11 time zones, so it need not suffer from claustrophobia. At the same time, Russia has never stayed within its borders. As a great nation, we have no conflicting national interests with it that I can discover, unless it goes, it starts again on its historic rhythm of reacquiring all the republics that have now become independent. Therefore, it is not enough to talk to their leaders only about economic development. They must understand that if this process starts again, whether we like it or not, the political processes in the democracies and the historic fears of Eastern Europe and the historic fears of Asia and the Middle East will produce inevitably the suspicion, the hostility, and the tensions which have been the, its sources of relations between Russia and the outside world and have poisoned these relations for 300 years under czars and commissars. So this is our challenge. For this reason, while I agree completely that the economic turn towards democracy and market economics is of crucial importance. It is also important that the new republics, Ukraine, Belarus, Baltic states, be perceived in Russia and in the outside world as the independent states which they aspire to be. Of course, they can have and should have and will have close relationships with a country as important and powerful as neighboring Russia. What should be prevented in the interest of the Russian people as well as in the interest of world peace 
It's a re-centralization. This is why I believe that the program with which, in principle, I agree, should be focused on all of Eastern Europe. It cannot be in our interest to see a no man's land develop between a powerful Germany and a recovering Russia, tempting hegemonial aspirations of either or both or conflicts of either between both. This is why I believe the area in between must be built into a relationship commensurate and must receive the attention commensurate to the one that is given to Russia. I want to repeat, Russia will have close to 200 million people. Russia has a huge nuclear uh, capacity. Russia will be a global power. There's no reason why Russia cannot be a friend of the United States and why it should not be treated as a partner in many important international issues. But structure contributes to motivation. And in this historic moment, to which President Nixon has so importantly called our attention, this is one of the elements which I wanted to take the liberty of elaborating on his concept. If what I described happens, then the center of gravity of Russia will move towards the Urals. In Central Asia today, we see an evolution that no one had thought possible. An infusion of Turkish, Iranian, and Russian influences, and in time, Chinese as well. With respect to that evolution, I believe that Russia and the United States have quite parallel interests in preventing the domination of these areas by fundamentalism. And indeed, in no part of the world do I see the need for the confrontations that we have experienced. And if the scope of the necessary evolution is kept in mind, no reason why Russian economic progress is not something that the United States should not support. Indeed, I think we should support it. I just want to fill in the territory between Eastern Europe, between the German border and the Russian border. And I want to remind people, especially with respect to Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary, who for 40 years were told that if they threw off their feathers, they would find a home in the West, that the democracies have a major obligation in that respect, and not only an obligation, but a self-interest. Still, I want to come back to where I started. There is a vacuum today produced by the collapse of two major historical forces. That vacuum must be filled 
Indeed, it will be filled. What President Nixon has done is to call our attention to the need and to some specific programs that can fill that need. <clears throat> As for the role of America, I have spoken here of some aspects like equilibrium, like problems that have no final solutions that have not been part of the American vocabulary and of American convictions. But I want to make clear that I do not believe that this, these can be the end of foreign policy. It was American perfectionism. American conviction that it represented values deeper than sim simply self-interest, that propelled America into the adventure and into the success of the Cold War period. And the curious thing is that with all the criticisms one can make of this or that aspect of American foreign policy, the people who tore themselves apart most was the American people, groping for perfection, lacerating its conscience, keeping on the road. And at the end, achieving what it had set out to do. Now, I can only hope that in the opportunity that has opened up before us, we can analyze the new situation in terms of the very conditions that we brought about to commit ourselves perhaps to avoid the anguish through which we went. So I only want to conclude by thanking President Nixon to give me this opportunity to appear on a program with him and to tell him that as a solitary individual without a huge machinery, he has again recalled us to our duty. Thank you very much. I'll take a few questions until uh, Dimitri, and then this gentleman. Okay, you first, and then Dimitri. Okay. Uh, how do you see Siberia fitting into the Russian puzzle? Will it be part of Russia, or will they go it alone? Who? Siberia. <clears throat> For me, uh, I consider um, his Siberia is historically part of Russia, uh, and it is now part of the Russian Republic. What may happen in the various autonomous regions within the Russian Republic uh, is something that uh, uh, I have no clear opinion on, and I must say I have another view. I do not believe that every problem in the world needs to be solved by the United States. Mr. Secretary, my question is about principle, policy, and outcome, the relationship between the three. You outlined principles 
which are commendable and non-controversial, I believe, at least as far as the vast majority of people in this room are concerned. But what about policy? It seems to me that Russia accepted that all these former republics are sovereign and entitled to be independent. That is not in dispute. Russia established diplomatic relations with these former republics and accepted their territorial integrity. It seems to me that under those circumstances, the United States would logically want to support the Russian government and the Russian leader, because when you support governments, you support their leaders, which are willing to do all the things which we wanted to do them for so long. Is it possible that if we fail to take yes for an answer, and if we are too unwilling to understand Russian pride, Russian consents, and Russian legitimate interests with the republics, with many of which they have long histories of rivalry and complicated disputes. Is it possible that instead of creating this great equilibrium and zone of stability which you so elo eloquently described, in which I believe is in everybody's interest, is it possible that we would push Russia in the direction of chauvinism, that we would appeal to Russian wounded pride, would undermine Yeltsin, and at the end would create a new Russian challenge to America? Well, as I try to make clear, I don't accept the proposition that we should conduct our foreign policy in order to support any one particular leader. And nor do I accept the proposition that a country can make us do something we shouldn't do for fear that somebody terrible will then come in, which incidentally we've been saying in Russia for 50 years. Uh, but I support economic assistance to Russia. I only want it to be a part of a program in which comparable assistance, of course allowing for the difference in size and, uh, and economies, is given to other republics like Belarus and Ukraine. I have no objection whatever to a specific program uh, for Russia. Secondly, uh, my impression is, for very understandable reasons, that Russian leaders find it very difficult to accept the proposition that they are now leaders of Russia. I think they find it very difficult to treat Ukraine, Belarus, and other nations as truly separate nations. And I believe that in many uh, of their minds, there is the idea that just as between 1917 and 1922 they were independent, uh, they will bring them back. Now, if Russia wanted to form a genuine confederation or a European-type community, uh, there's no conceivable reason why the United States should have any objection to it. Uh, the principle, uh, I'm not incidentally aware of the fact that Russia has sent ambassadors to these uh, countries or received ambassadors from them. Uh, I believe that that would be a very useful step. What I, uh, I'm not asking that Russia does anything that some leaders have not already said. I would like the United States to treat these republics as truly sovereign states, and not just send three or four people to Ukraine, which is after all a country of 58 million, but give it an adequate uh, representation. Uh, this is not to the detriment of Russia. It is to avoid temptations, since if you say these tendencies exist, they may come to the surface and they ought to be discouraged. But I'm not opposed to economic and economic program as part of a total program for Eastern Europe that includes also the, the former satellite countries. Dr. Kissinger, you spoke of... Uh, Secretary, could I just follow that up before we go on to another question? Isn't the point that Dimitri was making that in policy you don't have the luxury of often making that choice? For example, you say it, you have no objection to providing economic aid to the other republics. If no, I'm for it. We, I understand that. But the, if we provide a stabilization fund for the ruble, 
It makes the ruble the currency, in effect, that's internationally recognized, not only in Russia, but in the other republics. You yourself in your speech talk about the importance of interests. Isn't it in the American interest for Russia, the largest republic, the most important republic, the republic that is trusted by, at the moment, by Ukraine and by the other republics to a degree which even has surprised us, is it not in our interest to help and support Russia as the linchpin, the bulwark that uh, uh, can hold, uh, provide stability and hold this whole thing together? That's, that's the well, issue. Uh, that is the issue, and I just don't accept the proposition that the United States ought to build Russia into the position of pulling this, these countries together. Again, it's also not my impression that this universal trust exists, but I may be meeting the wrong people. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, that is exactly the issue. I simply don't accept the proposition that anybody who comes here and says something horrible is going to happen in my country unless you do what I want, uh, must that that must be accepted. But I also want to make clear that a Russia that is genuinely carrying out what it said, what many of its leaders have said, has no conflicting interests with the United States and should be treated with respect, care, and, and in many respects, partnership. This is not intended as an anti-Russian statement, but it is uh, to avoid temptations that 300 years of history uh, have produced and that cannot be eradicated by any one leader. Dr. Kissinger, you spoke of the uh if you, uh, over here, it's Charles Krauthammer. You, you spoke of the uh, historical proclivity of Russia to expand, but one could also speak of the historical pr proclivity of France to expand, which ended with Waterloo, and the century-old proclivity of Germany to expand, with ended with, which ended with, with the catastrophe of World War II. Uh, isn't it equally possible that the Russian proclivity to expand, however uh, historical it is, could equally as well uh, be tempered, if not ended, by the catastrophe of the, the collapse of the system and the loss of the historical the proclivity of France to expand ended when uh, was produced when it was surrounded by weak states. It ended when uh, what Pitt in his uh, called in the Pitt plan the great masses were created in Central Europe, so that the physical capacity of France to expand was curbed. Uh, it went on for another 40 years, but they never found a good place to uh, uh, to exercise it. And right uh, I, I just, I, uh, one My has to... My point simply is that defeat can be a ch can change historical proclivities. Certainly. And uh, I say you cannot base foreign policy entirely on conversion. Uh, and you have to look at a, uh, at, uh, if, if that happens, I consider it quite possible that if Russia for 20 years emphasizes the development of its own country, it will, one, become again a superpower. Secondly, it will live in peace with its environment. Third, it will have a major influence on all the smaller countries in the region. But we have to create that space where that happens, because neither in, uh, in the case of France uh, nor in the case of Germany did it occur simply by the appearance of one leader. But I could, if I could just to follow up, but r right now there is a plurality of leadership in, in Russia. It isn't as if we're dealing with a unified country with a single perspective or proclivity. And there is a party of non-expansion. There's a non-imperial party which happens to be in power. And wouldn't it be in our interest and also a, a way of promoting non-expansion on the, on the part of the Russians to actually help that party to succeed and uh, nobody is a, well first of all one has to define what one means by succeed secondly all I'm saying is we shouldn't single out Russia thirdly I think one should not one has to analyze uh, I don't want uh, on this occasion to go uh, leader by leader as to what uh, their arrière pensée may be, may be uh, on various uh, on various subjects, I do not believe the uh, uh, views of the political leadership are as simple as you describe them, but they could certainly be influenced by what Americans think about what they should be. 
I'm not imputing simplicity to them, but I think Yeltsin, by his actions, for example, of the, being the first to recognize the Baltics, is certainly Yeah, the, but the, the Russian army imperial. has not yet left the Baltics and shows no sign of leaving it. All I'm saying is there are tendencies and the American position with respect to them uh, ought, to be, uh, ought, ought to be made uh, clear. And we ought not to gamble everything on just dealing with one of these many republics. I'm not saying we should not give some aid or some significant aid uh, to Russia. If what you say is true, it would, should cost them absolutely no pain to, to, to be asked to confirm what you say they've already said. I'm going to have to hold it. Uh, the President, I think, wants to say something. And you have to be I don't do that. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I know we were all uh, very appreciative of Dr. Kissinger's presentation and he raised some uh, issues that should definitely be considered, but I, I don't want them, there to be any misunderstanding as I indicated to him uh, prior to his speaking today when we did discuss these matters. Uh, any misunderstanding as to what uh, my position is. As you will recall in my remarks yesterday, I was using the example of Russia, and I said this also applies. I didn't go into it because of time constraints, even though I'm supposed to control that in this conference. But in any event, uh, I made the point that uh, what I was saying about Russia in terms of age certainly applies to Eastern Europe. It applies to Poland, it applies to Czechoslovakia, it applies to any of the other countries, provided they have uh, shall we say, democratic systems and free market policies which have a chance to succeed. It certainly applies to Ukraine, no doubt about that. Uh, if I said anything else, uh, Dr. Brzezinski would uh, not have appeared today. But in any event, uh, I, or yesterday, uh, it applies to Ukraine, it, re it applies to the other Ru Soviet republics. So there's no disagreement on that. And in my emphasis on Russia, I was simply selecting the, the major nation where if it fails there, it's going to fail everywhere. If it fails there, it will have an enormous impact all over the world, and particularly if it succeeds there in Russia, because Russia is the place where it all began, it's going to have an impact on China, on the other, uh, the remaining communist states, and on dictatorships around the world. Uh, the second point that I would make, and I think uh, uh, Henry I think it's well that he remind us of the fact that Russia has been an expansionist power. Not just 300 years, it goes back even further than that. But it's been particularly so in for 300 years. He said under czars and commissars, we don't yet know whether it's going to be expansionist under democracies. That is the question here. I think that's the question that Dr. Krauthammer is raising. Uh, I don't mean the fact that a country is a democracy means that it will never be expansionist again. Because I am sure of this, if the current leadership fails, if this, ex this, if this democracy fails, and if a new despotism comes into power, it will then again be expansionist without question. Because the traditional Russian push toward expansionism will assert itself. There is a question, and Dr. Kissinger is very well advised to raise it. We can't assume that because we at the present time do have a democratic government, which has indicated that it is not going to be expansionist, which recognize the Baltic countries and we trust will work out proper relations with the others, there is a chance that this situation will change. And the Russia that has always previously been expansionist will no longer be so. I would finally conclude that by saying who would have thought that Japan would no longer be expansionist? It is no longer expansionist, in part because it was defeated, in part because it's a democracy. Who would have thought, looking at the Germans, and there are those that would disagree with that, they would, but uh, who would have thought that the Germans were no longer expansionist? And there are many people in Europe who still fear that they might be. Uh, I am not one of those that feels that simply because we have a democracy that we can think that peace isn't it's wonderful, it's because democracies don't begin wars. I state that, that's been the tradition in the past, but that can change. What we have to have in mind is at the present time, 
we have a chance, a chance in Russia, as well as in the other former Soviet states, particularly in Russia, with a government that proclaims itself to be democratic, which proclaims itself not to be expansionist, if it survives, then there is a chance that it will not embark on that traditional nationalistic junket again. If it does not survive, we can be sure it will revert to what it historically has been. That was the point I tried to make, and I think Henry Kissinger would agree with that. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, we have a schedule uh, for you to keep above all, and we want to thank you for your attention, attentiveness, and for your continued participation in the program. Before I uh, leave for my uh, my shuttle, I was going to say my uh, presidential plane, but uh, in that event, <laughs> before I leave for my shuttle, I would would like to say that. Uh, express appreciation, as I have already, to the panels, but also to those who made the conference possible, particularly to Jim Schlesinger, to Dimitri Symes, uh, to Teresa Hollingsworth, uh, to Bob Ellsworth, uh, uh, to uh, John Taylor. There are many others, but uh, it took a lot of people to put this conference on. For those, the panelists and the others who participated, for all those that helped plan it, for those of you who attended it, uh, I want to express a deep appreciation. Uh, we hope that uh, I'm going to say that you enjoyed it, but I've never thought that, you know, politics is about having fun and enjoying something. The question is, this was a serious conference, and I hope that you'll go away for possibly with a better understanding of the problems we face, but particularly with the great opportunities we have in this emerging world. Thank you very much. I think that uh, I should add a, a word of thanks to uh, Julie Eisenhower, is Julie still here, for her high-level recruitment, and to all of our volunteers and interns from local universities who have done so much uh, to facilitate this conference. Uh, and finally, to Sandy Quinn, who was the uh, particularly uh, effective in organizing the com conference and to all of you who have been so faithful in your attendance and in your attention thank you very much uh, on behalf of the Nixon library I want to close this conference thank you
written transcript of Henry Kissinger's remarks, please send $5 to C-SPAN Transcripts, Care of Tape Writer Incorporated, Box 885, Lincolnshire, Illinois, 60069.